here we go. Here we go. Are we ready? You know, it's interesting about that. Where often do you hear that phrase, here we go? You're going to hear it at the playground as a dad's trying to get his timid son or timid daughter to go down that slide. Usually it's because he's sitting right in his lap, going to go down together. And as they're getting ready to go, what does he say? Here we go. Whenever you go to the swimming pool for the first time and you're trying to teach somebody how to swim, there's often a fear there. Sometimes there's not, and you wish there was, but there's often a fear with getting in the water for the first time. You scoop them up, you jump right in. Here we go. Whenever you're getting ready to go on a long trip, here we go. I love that phrase because it reminds us that this life that we get to live, it's a journey. We have so many different things going on around us. There's so many adventures that we get to have as God's people. Now, what can we do but get up in the morning and say, here we go. Now, it's important to remember that every aspect of this journey, it's not always pleasant. You know, sometimes when someone receives that cancer diagnosis, the only thing they can say is, well, here we go. My life's different now. Or when that newly made single mom wakes up in the apartment by herself because the divorce finally went through and it's her first time living on her own. Here we go. Life is a journey. And this journey has highs and it has lows, but we must remember that it is a journey. You see, if we didn't remember that, instead we would fall into the trap that so many people fall into. And that trap, it looks like this. It looks like, I'll be happy when. Anybody ever said that? <clears throat> Come on now. For the teenager, I'll be happy when I can finally get out of my parents' house and go to college and be my own man. And then after a few years, I'll be happy when I can get out of college and get a job. Then I'll have my own money and I can do stuff with that. And then they get out and get that entry-level position, which often doesn't pay much at all. And so then it turns into, well, I'll be happy when I can get that promotion. I'll be happy when I can get married and have children, because then I won't be lonely anymore. But yet I've counseled many married couples with kids and grandkids who are incredibly lonely. I'll be happy when we can get the mortgage paid off. Then we'll have some extra money in our budget. We'll be able to do some fun things with it. I'll be happy when we can retire finally and finally live out our dreams. But the trap there, the danger, is that when those things come, you find out they weren't all they promised. They weren't all they were hyped up to be. If we look to those big events in order to give us meaning and purpose in life, when we find them, we find that we're left with just the same longings because they can't fulfill the meaning that they have. Another one that we hear right now, and this is a caution for all of us, for myself included, because I fell into this trap this morning. Pulled into the parking lot, parked right here, put on my gator to walk inside, and I just let slip. I'll be happy when we don't really have to wear these anymore. And the preacher's son pointed out, Dad, you're preaching on that today. You can't say that. It's the last time I share my messages with him. But anyways, <laughs> it's a trap we all fall into. I'll be happy when. But with Jesus, Jesus invites us on this journey. He invites us to live life as a journey. Because when we live life as a journey, that's when we can find joy and peace in the everyday aspects of life. In watching a sunrise and enjoying a cup of coffee and having friends for dinner and whatever it is, life is a journey. And within this journey, as with any journey, we have to have a guide, we have to have a leader. Now the tradition in our house when we're going on long trips is that we get everybody in the van and then for some reason the kids insist on praying for safety. I don't know what they're trying to tell me about my driving. But anyways, so we pray together. And then our system that we have is I drive and my beautiful wife, she's our navigator. And so she gets the directions all printed out. And we have GPS as a backup, but we're kind of old school, being like the turn-by-turn printed-off turn, thing. And then typically within 15 to 20 minutes of us going, she's fast asleep. And so I reach over, <laughs> grab the directions, put them right here, and then I'm the driver and the navigator. It works great, without exception. We have to have a guide 
for our journeys. And for life, it's no different. You see, there are so many different things and people that are screaming at us that we would follow them. Sometimes we're driven by our own desires, be it the desire for fame or fortune, the desire for a reputation, for respect. Sometimes we're driven out of our desires that come from pride, from lust. Some of these, many of these things come from within us and they lead us and guide us. Oftentimes there's many people that are crying out, saying, follow me, I know the way. They're trying to sell us a product and they say, if only you'll buy this product, then your life will be peaceful. They say, if only you buy this meal subscription service or this board game or whatever it is, then your kids will finally get along and you'll have a nice evening. Believe me, I'll be happy when that stuff doesn't work out. We have to have a guide. And within all of this chaos, all of this confusion, within everybody and everything vying for our attention and our allegiance, there's a whisper. There's a still, small voice, as the Bible describes it, that simply says, follow me. That's the voice I want us to hear today. And what's interesting is that we as a people and as a society, we aren't the first ones to seek guidance on this journey. We aren't the first ones to realize that we need it. We can't navigate it on our own. When we try to do that, we run into dead end after dead end. In fact, God's people have always looked and have always longed for the promised one, the one who God said he will send, that will deliver them, that will lead them, that will save them. And if you go through the history of God's people, you see they entered into the promised land, the land that God had set apart just for them so that they would be his people and, they would be, and he would be their God. And he told them, you live according to God's ways. You live as godly people. And then we will experience oneness right here. And over time, God's people did everything but live godly lives. And so they were sent into exile. They were sent into exile for many years. Some of them came back. Not everybody came back. In fact, the majority most likely stayed. But several of them came back as they said, we're going to start anew. We're going to recommit ourselves. We have a New Year's resolution right here that we're going to live the right way. And they rebuilt the temple and they tried to rebuild the priesthood. And then over time, they turned right back away from God yet again. And so over this course of five or six centuries, what you see is that though they were in exile and then came back, it's as if they kept living in exile because the Persians ruled over them and the Greeks ruled over them and the Egyptians ruled over them. And they experienced great persecution, great persecution for simply trying to live with God and to live as God's people. And then after the Egyptians, the Romans came in and they took over. Now, the Romans had this policy. They were more tolerant than most kingdoms and most empires to where they would say, you can do whatever religious practice you have as long as it doesn't interfere with us, as long as it doesn't interfere with the fact that we are your kings and we are your overlords. And so God's people, the Jews of the day, they would get up in the morning, look out the window and see Roman soldiers marching right down the road as a constant reminder of who was in charge. When they wanted to do really anything, they had to go to the Roman governor for permission as a reminder that he was the one that's in charge. Whenever any of them would get out of line or wouldn't live the way the Romans would tell them to live, then it was the Romans that would take them and put them in prison and kill some of them. As a reminder, it's the Romans who are in charge. You see, all through this time, God's people still felt as if they were living in exile. In the midst of all of that chaos and all of that confusion, there was a still, small whisper that constantly said, follow me. And so they longed for him and they prayed for him. And they said, God, would you send us the one whom you promised that would be our deliverer, that would be our savior. And then we see this very interesting scene. A very interesting man just kind of comes really out of nowhere. And I want you to see him and I want you to read about him. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Mark chapter 1. 
Now, Mark is the second gospel. It's the second book in the New Testament. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So find Mark's gospel and open it up to chapter 1. And here we have, starting in verse 4, Mark writes this. He says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. There's a few things here that are incredibly important to know. When it says that John the Baptist was in the wilderness... Mark's doing that on purpose because when the people would hear about the wilderness, they would immediately connect it to the Exodus, to when Moses led God's people out of slavery in Egypt and they spent their time in the wilderness. And so when they see that John the Baptist, that he is in the wilderness, they're seeing something. God's doing something here. Is John the one that will lead us out, that will deliver us? that will help us in our walks with God? Is he the one? And they would come out and confess their sins and were baptized. We'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Verse six, let's keep keep reading about John. It says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so John, he's out in the wilderness. That's where the prophets of old hung out. John's dressed like a prophet. He's got camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He eats like a prophet. By the way, you've seen all of these different biblical diet plans, right? Lose weight God's way or whatever it is. I haven't seen the locust and wild honey plan, but that could be... There could be something there. Maybe we can copyright that. I don't know. We'll see. And he gives this message. John says, the one whom you're looking for, I'm looking for him too. He says, it's not me. But he's coming right after me. And John says, as great as you think I am, remember the people look to him as the great prophet. John says, I've got nothing compared to the one who's coming the one who will come to lead you, to deliver you. Verse 9, right after this. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Jesus just comes on the scene. Now, something I love about seeing in Mark's gospel, and we'll see more of this as we continue, is that Jesus whom we know as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus, the one to whom all allegiance is due, you would expect that when he shows up on the scene, there'd be trumpets blaring and people dancing and great feasts and all kinds of celebration. But he just kind of comes out of nowhere. Mark says Jesus came and was baptized, rather nonchalantly. This is just simply what happened. But notice, John says there's one coming after me, and who came? Jesus. So who is this Jesus? And better yet, what is it that he calls us to? What kind of lifestyle does he call us to live? And what does he invite us to experience with him? Now, these are really the questions. The most important question anybody can ever ask and answer, who is Jesus? It's life-changing and paradigm-shifting. And no other decision we'll make in our entire life compares to that simple one. Who is Jesus? It's the most important question. And far too often, I feel as if when we try to answer that question, who is Jesus, our answers are influenced greatly by the journeys we've had in the past, by our experiences. And so we might see one little aspect of Jesus, but we miss, we miss the full thing. Do this for me. Go ahead and take your puzzle. Everybody still has their piece, right? Nobody's lost it? I'm telling you. If my girls are losing a piece, I'm going to tell them you did it. 
Look at this. Look at the front of there. Everybody see theirs? And if you can see the person's next to you, look at theirs. And we have a few on the screen, too, in case you didn't get one, and that's okay. Looking at your piece of the puzzle, what do you think the final picture will be? Now, this is an easy puzzle. It's only got 48 pieces. So somebody help me out here. What is the final picture going to be? A what? A yarn ball and a kitten. Why not? Anybody else? Nobody's got any ideas? A what? A desert. desert. Maybe there's some wilderness going on here. Who knows? Anybody else have any ideas? A cowboy. Somebody said cowboy. Oh, way in the back. Good job. Maybe. Looking at one piece, or even at, well, there's three up here, so looking at four or five pieces, it's really hard to see what the final picture is. Go ahead and put the final picture up there, Nathaniel. This is what that puzzle comes out of. We had some pretty good close guesses back there. That's from some movie, I don't know. Trolls, thank you. We, uh, all credit to Trolls uh, for copyright stuff. So that's from their movie. We had fun putting that together yesterday just for that picture. Now, do this for me. Take your piece of the puzzle and flip it over. And on the back, we sat down yesterday and rewrote out as many different descriptors, names, adjectives, different ways to describe who Jesus is. For example, mine up here, mine says Emmanuel. That's a name given to Christ in the Bible. It means God with us. What are some of yours? Who's got something else? Shield. Okay, what else? Fighter. Fighter. What? Ever present. Ever present. Way. Not Mike Way, somebody else. But he is the way. What? Provider, king, what else? Healer. Healer, that's a good one. What else? Ritual. Yes. <laughs> Thankful. Thankful. Faithful. Faithful. Sustainer. Sustainer, friend. Life. Life. Redeemer. Redeemer. We got all kinds of good ones here. Savior. Somebody said something over here. Ruler. 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 Teacher. Teacher, omnipresent. That's a big one. I actually had to look up how to spell that one. Don't, don't hold that against me. <laughs> All too often, or far too often, when we think of who Jesus is and we see these descriptors and these names, there tends to be one or two that we latch on and we grab hold of it. And we say, this is who Jesus is. You see, if you went through life and childhood and didn't really have any friends, if you were picked on and bullied a lot, and then you see that Jesus is the friend of sinners, then whenever Jesus comes to mind, you think friend. And that's how you interact with him. Or sometimes people grasp on to Jesus as healer. And they say, Jesus is our healer, and he wants to heal, and that's true. And Jesus does heal. We pray for healing today, and he does it today. But if we let that take over every thought we have of Jesus, then we're left with a big dilemma as to what happens when someone isn't healed. Or that's when you hear what a friend of mine heard as they were navigating great sickness in their family and then someone had said, well, if only you had more faith, then Jesus would have healed them. That's not true at all. Or sometimes we think of Jesus as our teacher. Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever lived. But if we only focus on Jesus as teacher, then we miss so much of who he is. Or if you were like me in the days before I came to Christ, whenever I thought of Jesus, I thought of a judge. I thought of one that was ready just to throw the book at me and point out every way that I've messed up. And I knew a bunch of them. And I knew there was a bunch more that I didn't know, if that makes sense to you. And so that kept me away from Jesus. I was saying, well, if I go to him, he's got his list ready of everything I've ever done wrong. And why would I want to hear that rehearsed? I have let that perspective of who Jesus is consume my, all of my thoughts about him. But we only get a full picture of who Jesus is when we take all of these different pieces and we put them together. Are you with me here, church? To remember that what we think about Jesus and however we identify him, oh, he's so much more. He is that, and he's more. So, so much more. Go ahead and set those down. Now, right here, oops, in our story today, we have another descriptor of Jesus. 
Look at verse 10. He was just baptized by John. And then it says this, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Another name for Jesus is the son of God. Now, what's interesting about that, during this time, when kings and emperors and even great generals, when they would have great victories, either over wars or battles or whatever it was, and they would come back home and they would parade through the streets and all the people would come out and praise them and show them honor for winning that great victory, they would say that that king is the son of God. That emperor, that general, they are the son of God. It was a way of saying and of celebrating the victory that they had won. Here, right after Jesus is baptized, it's crying out that he's the son of God. God himself says, this, this is my son. You think those kings and emperors are great? Look at this. This is the one whom I love. And with him, I am well pleased. And Jesus' life is a story of one victory after another, after another, all pointing towards the cross, all pointing towards the resurrection. Right from the very beginning, God is saying that this Jesus, who is he? Oh, he's my son. And I'm proud of him. I'm proud of my boy. Let's keep reading. Verse 12, so what happens with this Jesus, the son of God, the king, the ruler, the one who just accomplished this great victory? What does he do to celebrate? Verse 12, at once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. Jesus is driven out into the wilderness. Remember the wilderness. That's where the people met with God. That's where they experienced salvation and deliverance. And when it says here that he was being tempted by Satan and that he was with the wild animals, remember Mark wrote this at a time when the Christians were being persecuted all over the place. And whenever they would hear about wild animals, they didn't think about a zoo, they didn't think about the jungle, they thought about the arena where many of them would have been killed by wild animals. And so Mark's saying right here, the struggles that you have, the fears that you have, the obstacles in your life, Jesus faced them too. And he overcome. You see, this series that we're in, as we're looking at Mark's gospel, it's simply entitled, Our Journey with Jesus. We're looking at what does it look like to walk with Jesus and to follow Jesus. And when we think about that, what many folks think and they hear and they believe is that, well, when I follow Jesus, I won't experience any more suffering. I won't have any more struggles. And then there's many that go around the world and make all kinds of money saying, if only you'll believe in Jesus and give to my ministry, then you won't miscarry anymore. And your kids won't get sick. And you won't have to go out looking for food because you'll have it right here. That doesn't stand up to scripture, church. The life with Jesus, it's full of joy. It's full of peace. And it comes with great struggles. Jesus experienced them. John experienced them. And in our own lives with Jesus, we'll experience struggles too. But oh, is it worth it? Oh, it's worth every moment and every bit. And so after this, after Jesus, he's baptized. He spends time in the wilderness. He overcomes the temptations of Satan. He brings freedom because he himself is free. Do you need freedom today, church? Jesus is the one that gives it. Who is Jesus? Who is he really? With all of these things in mind, back up to verse 1, the very beginning of the gospel. Mark says this, he says, the beginning of the good news, the gospel, about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. 
a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for him. Who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the one that brings all the meaning and purpose that you've been searching for your whole life. He is the one that brings the joy and the peace that you've been searching for for years. Jesus is the one. Turn to him, church. Oh, turn to him. And you will experience life to its fullest in every way. Another way to say that is to follow, follow Jesus. What does that look like? Well, verse 14, after John was put in prison, there are struggles in this life, church. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So how do we respond to Jesus? Well, we repent. And we believe. What does it mean to repent? This is what they mentioned earlier with John, that the people came out and confessed their sins. Well, to repent simply means to turn. It means I was going this direction in my life, and now I'm going this direction over here. I have turned. I have repented. You see, before Christ, we are living, pursuing our own dreams, pursuing our desires, pursuing everything within us, even though many of it, it just isn't good. You see, before Christ, this is where we're pursuing to fulfill our pride and our lust and our desires to prove that we're better than everybody. When before Jesus, this is where we are going to maybe show that we don't need anybody at all. We can do this on our own. This is where the anger and the bitterness and hopelessness and meaninglessness and all of these things are. They reside right here. And before Christ... We were chasing that with all of our heart and with everything we could muster. But then there comes a moment when someone hears that voice that says, follow me. And maybe they heard it for the first time or the hundredth time, but something clicks and they say, okay, here we go. And that life now looks totally different. You see, that life now has the love of God within it. That life, as we pursue Jesus, has meaning in it. That life is based off of purpose, off of the purpose of loving God, which then leads to loving people, which then leads to living it out, to doing something with this love. The purpose and the meaning that so many people are searching for, that everybody's searching for, they're looking in the wrong spot. When we repent, that's when we turn and we say, yes, Jesus, you are are everything that I've been looking for. We repent, make a change in our lives, and we believe. What does it mean to believe the gospel? It means that we believe Jesus, we agree with him with who he said he was. Jesus says he's the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus says he has come to lead us and forgive us. And so when we believe, we say, yes, Lord, you are all of that, and you are so much more. Have you come to a place in your life where you've made that decision, church? Some of you have, some of you haven't. What's holding you back? What's keeping you pursuing this stuff over here? I'll be happy when and realizing that those things never come. I'll be happy someday. Someday's not on the calendar. Those things don't come on their own. What's keeping you from seeing that Jesus, he is the source of everything that I look for, everything that I long for. He is the one that loves me dearly and accepts me. You see, too often, we'll talk about this in just a moment, we feel as if, well, I'll come to Jesus, but first I gotta get my life figured out. There's a few things I gotta work through. I gotta quit doing this, that, and the other. I need to do some good stuff. I need to start going to church more, and I need to watch only PG-13 movies or whatever it is. People have all kinds of different things on their list that they gotta get done before they can come to Jesus. Well, remember, we took communion this morning. What does communion mean? It's already been dealt with. All of that stuff. Jesus is already done. You see, Jesus doesn't stand over here and call out to us and say, hey, take some of these steps, come and see me in a few years, and then we can have life together. 
No, Jesus comes to get us. Puts his arm around us. He says, hey, you ready for life? Here we go. And then he walks with us as we go. That's the Jesus that we follow, church. That's the one whom we look for and we long for. That's the one that's that still small voice that says, follow me. Look at verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I will send you out to fish for people. You think what you have right now is great, Jesus is saying, come and live life with me. And oh, then you'll experience life to the fullest. At once, they left their nests, they left their livelihood, they left everything that they knew, and they followed Jesus. Verse 19, when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. They were also fishermen. And without delay, he called them. And what did he call out? Follow me. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. They left everything that they knew, and they followed Jesus. This is what it means, church, to repent and to believe. And you know what? Jesus gives us the same invitation today. Not only does he give us this invitation, he gives the same call to every person we've ever known. And you all know the ones I'm talking about. Those in your family and it seems as if they're searching for meaning, they're searching for purpose, but they keep looking in all the wrong places and they keep turning up empty. Jesus is calling them, follow me. The ones at your work who you look at and you see their lives and you wonder, how can anybody make it with that lifestyle? Jesus is calling them and he's saying, follow me. In your own hearts, when you stay up late at night filled with dread, over something going on in your life, over a wayward child, over a cancer diagnosis, over a lost job, Jesus whispers the same thing to you. Follow me. Worship band, come back up here, please. Don't fall into the trap, church. You can close your Bibles. Don't fall into the trap of saying, I'll be happy when of saying, I'll have meaning when, of saying, my life will have purpose when. Don't fall into that trap. Instead, hear the call of God as he says, follow me. Turn to him, O church. Or maybe some of you, maybe you're not falling for that trap, but maybe you feel like you're in the wilderness right now. That as we're talking about the wilderness, you're thinking, it sounds like my home. It's barren. There's nothing there. Jesus is calling you, and he's saying, follow me. Turn to him, church. Repent and believe. You see, in my own life, it looked a little bit like this. I was searching for that joy and peace in my life. And I searched for it in many different places, and I'll spare you that story. And the short of it is, it wasn't there. But then one day, one day, Jesus came to me and I heard this voice that said, follow me. Later I learned that, I, and I believe this completely, as a direct result of the prayers of my wife. If you're praying for someone that's far from God, keep praying. God's working there. He's doing something. But when Jesus spoke those words, and it wasn't as if the clouds parted and the angels descended and light filled the room and there was a voice booming that said, follow me. No, it was much louder than that. If you know what I'm saying. And when I turned to him, expecting that judge, expecting to have everything that I've ever done drugged through the mud, I didn't see any of that. Instead, when I turned to Jesus, there was arms open like this, saying, come, follow me, and we'll do life together. 
Now what I want us to do in our closing time here is this. There's a few other descriptors of Jesus that I want us to be aware of and I want us to know. And we've sang this before, but I want us to sing it now and to remember who Jesus is. And then we're going to come back together and we want to pray. Not only for each of you, for each of us, that we would follow Jesus either for the first time or the hundredth time, but that we might have a time just to pray for those in your life, in your circles, whom you know, oh, they're seeking. And you have the answer. And the answer is Jesus. So let's do this, church.